Viewers, better than expected GDP numbers for Q3 have led the centre to revise upwards the growth figures for the Indian economy. The centre now expects the economy to grow at 7.6% in FY24, higher than the previous estimate of 7.3%. The numbers are helping the government tell voters that it is doing a great job on the economic front. Burgeoning GDP numbers as they are telling you a macro picture are by far an easier sell than any number of slick advertisements to counter opposition parties and critics. But it isn't the GDP numbers alone. For the first time in about 11 years, the government of India has released an All India Household Consumption Expenditure Survey. Now the term suggests what it aspires to mean, viewers. It means that this survey calculates how each household in urban and rural India is spending its money, what it is spending it on, so to speak. That's why it's called the All India Household Consumption Expenditure Survey. The results from the survey paint an encouraging picture of economic uplift in rural India. At least that's what some people suggest. Here are some of the key highlights with a few lines against each to explain what the data means. The first highlight is on your screens. The share of spending on food in India between 1999 and 2000. This is the National Sample Survey 55th round and 2022-23 has gradually declined for both urban and rural households. It is for the first time that expenditure on food has fallen to less than 50% of the total consumption expenditure in rural India and to less than 40% in urban India. So what is the takeaway? What do we mean by this? Not as if people are starving themselves, viewers. What this means is that if food spends decline, it means people can spend more on consumer durables, clothing, footwear, petrol or diesel for their vehicles and even for entertainment. In other words, you can aspire for more. So therefore, this is a good sign overall. Much more money is being spent for better nutrition beyond just cereals. Rice, wheat, etc. Expenditure on cereals was almost 22% of the total consumption expenditure in rural households in 1999-2000. Now, it is down to 4.91%. In urban households, let's look at that, it was 12%. It is now down to 3.64%. What does this mean? What's the takeaway? more spending on better nutrition beyond cereals. That's really what people are concluding. Some, of course, don't believe that this indicates that, but we'll come to the granular arguments in just a few moments. The spending on high-value nutritional items such as eggs, fish and meat and fruits and vegetables has gone up more in rural households than in urban households over the last two decades. So viewers, again, rural India or Bharat, as some people like to call it, is catching up, closing the gap with urban India. Here the takeaway is that rural Indians are eating better and narrowing the nutrition gap with urban Indians, which can only be happening, viewers, if they have a little bit more elbow room to spend, which suggests that perhaps the situation is not as dire as some people paint it out to be with regards to rural India. The gap between average urban and rural MPCE as a proportion of rural MPCE, which is the consumption expenditure as we just told you, has also reduced dramatically to 71% in 2022 and 23, from 84% in 2011 and 2012. The broad takeaway, what we know from this is that rural livelihoods are seeing an improvement. And within both rural and urban segments, consumption spending inequality between the bottommost 5% and the topmost 5% of population has reduced dramatically. What does all this imply? The takeaway is that 
Government of India policy initiatives for enhancing rural incomes have worked to some extent. Now, let's analyze these data sets, the GDP and of course, this great big MPCE survey, which has come out after 11 years. Obviously, it fills a huge gap and one requires surveys like this to get a better understanding really of where things stand because it helps in fine-tuning policy. So, it's welcome that this particular survey, though belated, has actually taken place and thrown up some results. But what do we make of all this data? We have sets of economists. We also have a BJP spokesperson who wears an economist hat also with us. So, we should have an engaging discussion viewers. Dipanshu Mohan, professor and dean of the OP Jindal Global University, visiting professor at the LSE, the London School of Economics is here with us. Santosh Mehrotra, economist, needs no introduction. Karan Bhaseen, also uh, an economist who's very well known, has been on our panels. And Sayyid Zafar Islam, the national spokesperson of the BJP, who's banker at one time and knows a great deal about macroeconomics. So let's, let's begin by asking some basic questions. I want to start with Karan Bhaseen and Mr. Mehrotra first. Um, Mr. Bhaseen, let's look at the GDP numbers very quickly and let's have a conversation with the four of us on the GDP numbers very quickly, get a sense of where things are. Uh, what is your reading of this better than expected GDP number that has come up? I think it surprised quite a few people. Right. So, when last year the numbers were a bit underwhelming uh, relative to high frequency indicators and this has been some time, you know, there's some mismatch between high frequency indicators and and growth rate and growth rate seems to kind of, you know, lag by an entire uh, year. So, what happens now is that your high frequency indicators are exceptionally good, but GDP kind of underestimates it initially and then the lag effect kind of feeds into the next year. Hmm. Uh, so, some of it is coming from that, but even 6.7% of the GVA is quite good. Now, I see this a lot of, a lot of this discussion is about subsidies being added, which is where the gap between GDP and GVA has gone up. Uh, but essentially, if you look at it from an, the way, you know, GDP is calculated and the way accounting is done, essentially GDP is nothing but consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. Hmm. And uh, what consumption is, it's, it's uh, investments equal saving and then, you know, consumption plus uh, savings is the disposable income. And then you have to kind of add taxes to get a measure of, you know, total income. You can't just take away taxes and subsidies from it. Hmm. So that's what's happening over here. I, I think many people are kind of, you know, looking at GVA and GDP as like two separate uh, measures, but essentially one feeds into the other. Uh, the more surprising thing, which unfortunately many people have missed, is that India's real investment rates are near the highest level it has been historically. So a lot of people look at investment rates using nominal investment rates, which basically means they look at it in current prices and then they say that because GDP is in current prices and investment is in current prices, you can look at the nominal investment rates. That works in normal time. The reason it does not work since the last decade is because investment goods prices have kind of, you know, not grown as fast as other prices have. Hmm. And that's why there's a difference in the prices of the numerator and the denominator. So you need to look at the real investment rate. And it's, it's you know, uh, for, for long term growth, it's a very important determinant. And if it is at a high, uh, you know, at a near all time high, what it is telling you is that investment in investment in India has actually picked up. Hmm. And investor sentiment is, is no, you know, you very about, positive. So. Uh, private um, uh, no, investment I'm, or are you talking I'm, about foreign investment what do you exactly just specify I'm talking about I'm talking about total investment now the right. reason why foreign investment has you know kind of dwindled over the last couple of years is some of it is because of the US Federal hmm. Reserve policy like for instance I'm getting a 6% interest rate on my savings account in the US hmm. which is much higher than what I was getting in India so hmm. that's an anomaly hmm. and the other point is that India also kind of withdrew from you know the uh, uh, bilateral tribunal which has created some uh, concern among foreign investors who are not very keen to get involved with Indian judiciary due to litigation and, and time consuming. So, they are trying to figure out a way to address that issue and then they will probably, you know, once interest rates kind of normalize, they might again start looking at pushing investments into India. But there's a lot of uh, brick and mortar investments that are happening in, in manufacturing sector any which way. So, even with those two tail, it, it's, it's a uh, 
I think it's a very positive story for India overall, at least for the next couple of years. Okay, let's let's open this up on the GDP question, Santosh Mehrotra. Um, if you really look at the numbers, the data that was presented, manufacturing and construction, 11.6% year on year and 9.5% year on year respectively is up. So that is, that looks uh, like a good number and also suggests that that's where the jobs are. So maybe the situation with regards to jobs is also not as dire as some people paint it to be. S the service sector has fared well. Trade, a hotel, transport, communication, in addition to financial, real estate and professional services also picking up there. So are we, are we doing well now? Would you concede? Because I know that sometimes you have sort of uh, struck uh, uh, a, a, how should one put it, a, a caveat or two. So let's just remind ourselves, Rahul, that uh, this is a quarterly estimate. Mm. And quarterly estimates, by definition in our country for the longest time, are precisely that. They are estimates. They are not very reliable, have never been, because they are based on very partial data. This is point one. Point two is that uh, the same quarter last year had minus 2.2% manufacturing growth, which means negative. So there's a, there's a base effect in, the, in respect of manufacturing. Manufacturing has certainly revived. It's grown faster now, but it, the, the, the size of the manufacturing growth in this quarter is on account of the base effect. Construction is was okay in the same quarter la last year and is doing okay. Mm. So, yes, I'm not uh, overly surprised by the 8.4%. But the third point which your viewers need to appreciate and understand is the following. That in our country, estimates of GDP are sent into the government of India by the CSO four times. It's only after the fourth effort that a annual estimate is finalized. An annual estimate is finalized. Forget about a quarterly. So I have never in watching the Indian economy taken the quarterly estimate overly seriously. Let's just recall that even for 23-24, we had an estimate at the beginning of January called the first provisional, first advanced estimates. We now have the second advanced estimates. And that's the first advanced estimates are merely based on seven months. Now you have the second advanced estimates, which are not, which don't include the last quarter because the last quarter is not even over. And then you will uh, later this year have the first provisional estimates later this year when the full financial year is over. And then about one and a half years from today, you'll have the actual 23-24 data. Yeah, but this is so, not different from, you know, times no, gone. Yeah. So this is, this is part, I mean, are we, are we now just nitpicking? I'm I mean, look. i about this. How reliable is a quarterly estimate in our country? No, but we already, the, look, it's not as if this is the first time that someone is projecting, uh, yeah. you know, quarterly data. This is... Uh, thank you. This is thank you. So that, thank you. Precisely the point. Yeah. And never and do not uh, do not discount what I began by saying, which mm -hmm. is that there is a base effect here. Okay, uh, but there were economists, um, Dipanchu Mohan, who said it's not going to be above five percent at all. Uh, you know, there, there there was a very well-known economist, Raghuram Rajan, who sat uh, with Rahul Gandhi and and predicted. He said, take it from me in writing. We're not going to go above 5%. And here the numbers, you know, I mean, you look at the international agencies, etc. They certainly put it beyond 5%, no doubt. Yeah, so my intervention here would be largely in context to saying what the underlying composition of the growth numbers are telling us. And when you try to map that with other macroeconomic aggregates and realities, what is that we are able to see. Mm. So, what it does is that there is some kind of a cross validation process, a point I have been sort of making for a long time because if you look at just GDP data and method methodology, 
there is just an endless uh, cycle of conversations one can have about estimates and just the methodology of it. I will give you one short example, like the current quarterly estimate that has come out uh, clearly has factored in uh, uh, an effect of a higher tax revenue and a lower subsidy uh, budgeting, which has worked in the favor of a larger uh, quarterly GDP number. If you look at the last year, the fertilizer expense that was there for the government was much higher because it was costly to import fertilizers. Mm -hmm. So, we did not have that kind of a quarterly GDP number. I do agree with Professor Mehrutra that it is good always to look at the annual data as against sort of the quarterly estimates. Having said that, I think the point that I have been largely making, I will not comment on what Dr. Rajan said in what context, but I mean generally it is being anticipated India is going to on a GDP level if you are looking at even GVA numbers, this gross value added, India is growing above 6 percent. So, the general average we are looking at is 6 to 7 percent, if that is what on an average we are going to anticipate uh, over the year, even if that is so the there case. there is an upward trajectory. Yeah, yeah that there is, is that is there. But what, that. Now, yeah, yeah, whether no, I am <laughs> yeah. going to look at numbers the way they are, but what I am particularly concerned is private consumption expenditure holds the largest proportion of our GDP calculations, right. Now, this is if you look at the numbers for 2023-24, this is 55.6 percent of the GDP. The last time this was as low as this one was 2010 and 11 when it was around 55.1 percent of the GDP. Why I am mentioning about this is because India's growth story is largely a consumption driven economy which thrives on demand and how consumption demand rises. Now, we can argue and we will do that over the course of the show where, where what strata is consuming more as against what is not uh, at that same level. But if your consumption expenditure as proportion of GDP is at as low as it is, which is right now the case, we ought to ask the question where is much of the growth coming from and the answer to that lies in government spending. All this money which has gone on capex, uh, on capital expenditure that the government is spending is largely making the growth reach that 6 percent mark. I'm, I would be surprised if this number was going to be anywhere below 4 percent if much of the spending would have gone in revenue expenditure as against to the money that was going on capital, which is a structural issue with our private investments. But, uh, but you would agree yeah. that this money is not being flushed down the drain. It is no, leading no, to I the agree. creation yeah, of assets, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which will obviously boost uh, the economy at some point. So, it's, it's I, mean, helping I, I, us reach I know the 6 that, yeah, let me bring yeah. in uh, Sayed Zafari. I know True. that one grouse perhaps even the political class, the ruling political class has right now uh, with India Inc. Let me be very blunt with you, Sayyid Zafar Islam, is that they have not really come to the party. Now, this has also been implied in the budget speech by Nirmila Sitaram, the interim budget uh, speech. She is hoping, of course, a lot is predicated th on this prospective expenditure that will happen, investment that will happen from big business. So, what's what's keeping them, let's say, <coughs> away from the party, Mr. Istam? What's the issue? Rahul, <coughs> let me first give you one statistics. Yeah. Today, the Q3 uh, number, the uh, GDP number is 8.4 percent. And yeah. if you just compare the same Q3 number in 2014, it was 5.3. That only suggests that was what we are trying to tell you time and again, everyone. That time, it was a very uh, badly managed economy. It was a fragile economy, policy paralysis. Today, is a thriving economy where the last quarter is suggesting 8.4 percent. And all the structural reforms which had to be undertaken has been undertaken. All the policy initiative, policy reforms to, to enable the economy to grow faster, back on track and grow faster is something which has been demonstrated by the government of India. Having said that, one has to, as somebody mentioned about the High frequency data, all high frequency data suggests there is a economic activity. To uh, see the uh, uh, manufacturing PMI, that so there is uh, more than 50 percent, it was 56, 57 percent, likewise services PMI, a uh, similar number, 56, even if it went to up to 60. So that only suggests there is a lot of momentum, a lot of activity, economic activities, and it, especially after the COVID and especially after all the restructural reforms which had been taken, undertaken to make this, uh, uh, the foundation very solid has not been done. And as the Honorable Prime Minister has said that Bodhi 3 
point zero, we will take some more important legislation, bring much, uh, important legislation to ensure the economy will rise further. Having said that, now the question you have posed about the private investment, which why is not taking place? There are three, four reasons, sir, Rahul. Let me explain to you why. First, in 2014, just see, in 2014, what was the state of the economy? Hmm. The, the loan which has been disbursed between 2006 to 2013, from 18 lakh crore, since 1947, the balance sheet size of the nationalized bank, actually ballooned to 52 lakh crore in, in just six years. Means the loan which had been given to Corporates at that point in time, it was just based on the phone call. It was money given to loan uh, as loan to the bank by by the bank to the corporate without doing a proper credit evaluation. As a result, what happened? 67 percent. At in 2014 itself, the report suggests uh, Credit Suisse report suggests 67 percent of the loan dispersed during 2006 and 2014, 13 actually had negative EBITDA. When you have negative EBITDA, means the, from day one. It is a loss-making proposition. There, there is no enough uh, cash flows to service those debts. So okay. eventually what happened? We inherited economy, a bank which has full of NPS. And private private corporates had taken large loan and which actually turned it to be NPA. Then you had excess capacity in the system. So slowly, slowly we recapitalized the bank. We bank put, brought the bank from nowhere to in a very sound position. Today bank is in a position to lend uh, uh, to the corporates and they are lending now. Uh, the excess capacity in the system now it more or less uh, has come off. It is uh, the capacity utilization is around 77, 78 percent. You will see in Podi 3 that there will be a lot more investment by the private uh, participation okay, by the so, private corporate. And so the situation we were expecting definitely obtains. when we gave them some rebate on tax, we were expecting some, some animal spread when mm -hmm. we gave them uh, some tax swaps in uh, two or three years ago. We were expecting definitely animal spirit will come from the private sector. We didn't. But now the situation is such that they have okay. no option Th but Karan to Bhaseen, put up new, Are you new optimistic new things project, will change as project. we go forward, Karan Bhaseen? Well, I mean, the purpose of the tax cut was actually fulfilling a promise that uh, Finance Minister Jaitley had made in this first budget. And I think uh, that did play a big role because it allowed corporate balance sheets to be healthier going into the pandemic. Like, yeah. imagine the situation where you wouldn't have done that and corporates were still as leveraged as pre-pandemic, it would have been a much worse situation for you in terms of, you know, loss of uh, your permanent capital stock. Hmm. So in, in that context, you know, we we need to also put into perspective what we went through over the last couple of years. Uh, it was a terrible time, you know, you, you had a lockdown in much of the world True. for about a quarter of a quarter. Yeah, but we're no longer in that situation. Hmm. So... I mean, yeah, but balance sheets take time to recover, right? Like okay. balance sheets would, would typically not recover instantaneously. People would expect So there is a hangover recover. COVID effect. Yeah. There is a black swan event that is sort of left a shadow and perhaps made people a little more mean spirited with spending. Okay, well, you know, let's let's right. see how that plays out. But I just want to come to the second part of this um, entire debate because uh, what we're also seeing is, and this is on the back of the survey conducted for the first time in 11 years. Now, um, and we are talking about the All India Household uh, Consumption Expenditure Survey. What, what for you are the main takeaways um, from this particular survey, uh, Mr. Mohan? So, I would see the survey as, uh, I mean, first of all, it's a welcome uh, database to have, a long time awaited yeah. uh, database because as I mean, anyone doing macroeconomics in India cannot make any credible analysis on information on inequality True. without looking at consumption data. In fact, India is one of those. Yeah, I mean, beyond the economies. obvious. I mean, obviously, yeah, this yeah. is a welcome thing. So now let's get da into no, 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 no. what but, the numbers but, are telling but us. But the numbers that are telling us is. I mean, objectively reading it, yeah. it looks as if the gap is narrowing. No. Between uh, rural no. Bharat, if you want to no, you know, sort of what use you that get, in India urban India. What you get is that rural consumption overall is increasing mm. and has increased by roughly around 3.1 percent. You have urban consumption level increasing by around 2.7 percent. But in a 6 percent growth story, uh, this is anticipated that you would expect this to happen. What you would not perhaps see, see for me what you want to look at is the strata at which uh, the income, sorry, consumption groups 
are positioned. Uh, you have a very different reality for the classes that are doing relatively better or have received a higher level of income or wealth endowment over time. Uh, there is a lot of inf important information in this survey around how consumption habits in India in rural and urban areas changed drastically and you were pointing it out at the beginning of the show, so that is important for the audience to know. What you do want to look at very carefully is how the bottom 5 percent uh, is doing and which is not going to be effectively captured unless uh, the second uh, survey around this is done. Because and I want the viewers to know this, there is a drastic change in the methodology in which and I mean Professor Marutra has written about this, some of us have been arguing this that since 2017-18 the, the, the consumption expenditure uh, survey results were quashed and the government wanted to sort of change the methodology in which this was done. So, you have now a much more robust uh, mechanism, there are some I mean there are always sampling issues here and there that one can always argue, but what you want to look at is uh, a more frequent mechanism to be able to collect the data. Uh, Dr. Pranab Swain has written repeatedly talked about this that this will it will give us a good picture of unit level analysis of mm. what households are doing once those numbers are out that is by the end of this year. I would caution against making any uh, predicament or analysis on poverty Predic or, yeah, or, 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 or no I mean even credible analysis on poverty estimates right now mm. will be a huge leap of faith uh, okay. to make at the current juncture. Yeah. You want to no, just one thing which yeah. I wanted to say was that on consumption uh, between rural and urban areas, mm. if urban areas are consuming much lesser than rural areas, we ought to ask the question what is the nature of our growth trajectory over time moving. We need to know that where much of our jobs, urban, social, economic mobility happens to the growth of the urban areas. But, but, but the rural urban gap is the narrowest for the lowest 20 percent of the population, mm. that is because whether it is good or bad, I am not saying. Agriculture households with uh, unviable land holdings have no choice but to look for other income. So look that, for further income, yes, which, so which, which makes us to ask what is happening on the nature of farming okay. and agricultural activity, which if you look at the GDP data now tells us that agricultural activity has gone down considerably and you would then lead to having farmers expecting for lot social and price protection because farming overall is not doing that well because input costs have gone up. So, I mean what we want to be very clear is about is strata based analysis which is which group are we talking about, which position okay. are we taking. Let me let me bring in Karan Bhaseen, he is raising his hand. Yes, Karan Bhaseen and before that, uh, after that so, I bring in Mehrotra and uh, Mr. Islam. Yeah. Go so, ahead. you know we do get distribution, we do get fractiles of consumption distribution based on which we can actually conduct a lot of the analysis and typically you just need this distribution to be able to analyze poverty that is how it has historically been done yeah. and that is how it you know it is always been this case and I think we have to be a bit careful with the way we are defining things. The methodology itself has not changed because we are still using the mixed modified recall period. It is the same questioner divided into three separate visits. So, the number of visits have changed but the underlying thing that we are measuring and the method uh, of recall period that is used is the same. Now, I have three specific questions to uh, Professor Merotra and I want a yes or no answer because that will give a lot of context going forward into this debate. Okay. First question is, is he on record saying that poverty in India is 25.9 percent well contrary to the estimates of not just the World Bank but every other estimate since then and does he now recognize that his estimates were way of using PLFS which of course no one does, no one uses employment unemployment uh, uh, surveys to do poverty estimation and is his you know disagreement with the use of this survey largely driven from the fact that he gave the highest possible poverty estimate which was way off relative to the new data. Second question and I am expecting just yes and no answers. Second question, <laughs> does the new household consumption expenditure survey still use the modified mixed recall period which was recommended by the planning commission as the default method for estimating poverty and I am not going about the three visits. but does it still use the MMRP method or not? This is the second pointed question. And third question because he wrote a recent article on this, is there any place in the entire fact sheet which says that the two surveys are not comparable? Because I actually read through the fact sheet, the disclaimer it says and I am reading and quoting uh, in quote the, uh, the changes made and 
the quotes begin these are required to be noted while comparing the results of this survey with the previous round so it's it mentions the three or four changes that it makes none of those changes are making a reference to the change in sampling frame because this is to bring this in line with plfs okay. which was the case even before when the ces survey sampling frame was consistent with the employment unemployment survey so poverty was so, let, 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 but let, we need to know that second, we can mr mehrotra one second let, let's panelists. go to mr mehrotra <laughs> mr mehrotra the first question poverty estimate way off relative no, no, to no, the no. new new I data know the yes no don't have to repeat okay. anything okay sorry i got the question yeah okay first of all when the hindu published my piece in 2021 based on the plfs they put out the wrong version and there was nothing i could do about it and so I, the hindu I is to blame okay the no, news it's not no 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 hold on hold on no, i haven't finished so there are there's no yes or no answer you know who, who is mr karan basin to ask me yes or no in any case <laughs> Uh, I mean, he ought to have be, be a little bit more modest when he approaches a, 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 a professor who is sort of twenty times his twenty years his senior, or maybe even thirty. Anyway, so the point is, we had put out an estimate using the PLFS, but there we had made adjustments using the CES for two thousand and four and the CES for two thousand and eleven twelve, and you and and you there is always. Uh, a higher poverty estimate that you are going to get from a one question out of plfs and and we had adjusted for that in our real estimate and it, you know later on we had made this very clear and poverty and we were estimating it please remember for 2020 and the world bank's own estimate for poverty for 2020 is the following that in the world 70 million people were added to the poor in in uh, in in the first year of covid of which 80% came from india world bank official estimate so i made two points about the, his first question on his second and third questions let me be very clear clear and straightforward yes it's still the mmrp however the changes are so significant in the number of consumer products in the methodology in the substratum as i have explained that it is only right that the nso has said to me i was a member of the standing committee on economic statistics for 3 years from 2020 to 2022 and they themselves said that the numbers will not be comparable So let's just close this debate, Mr. No, but, Basin. But, but hang on, hang on, Mr. Mehrotra. It's being very simplistic here. Look, consumption patterns do Please. change Please. over twelve years. Please. They would Please. definitely Please. change. Baba, clear me out. Are you Baba? Clear me out. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not interrupting I Basin. So I wasn't interrupting Basin. I don't expect Basin to be interrupting me. Okay, and uh, Rahul, please, ho, ho, uh, you know, uh, uh, manage this show. Yeah. So I'm, I'm suggesting that. This, the NSSO themselves don't believe that this is comparable. Point one. This is the most important point that we need to keep in mind. Hmm. The methodology has changed dramatically. Pranab Sen has said so himself. Okay. The two are not comparable. Okay. Okay. And and in addition, let us remember that all that the CSO has put out just NSSO has put out just now is a twenty-seven page fact sheet. Okay. and the fact sheet is all in terms of ratios and proportions and anyone who is drawing any any conclusions based on the rupee value of the numbers that are put out in the 27 pages is making a gross mistake okay Gro gross gross mistake. mistake karan basin quick response and then i want to so uh, 20, bring the shutters so down even yeah. Even yeah. for 2020, and I have the World Bank pip in front of me. It's about 14 percent. So we have to give me the from, yeah from that. Yeah. And the second now. point, yeah. Uh, yeah. and the second point, you know, if this comparable issue would have been a genuine concern, it would have been mentioned in the report. I am saying that with with utmost, you know, kind of hum humility, humility that if you really think it's not comparable, do 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 a proper analysis on the unobservables because what you're comparing is unobservables in the data. And try to publish in a decent journal. 
because really you can't make this claim and if so it is uncomparable and so is plfs with respect to employment unemployment survey okay. which you were very conveniently comparing in the past so it the should be peer reviewed in, from, a, in a in a yeah, in a court because the decent fact is, unquote the fact journal is, okay so i didn't i didn't i didn't end up like okay fair, fair enough look no, let, no, 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 let me let me let me let me complete the third point that i'm making is that the reason the change the reason why we went from a single visit to three visits is largely because there are 400 questions and it takes about 3 to 4 hours to do it the previous way no in fact i survey, believe that that, that, that would be, be that would be a more detailed so exercise reducing, now which is yeah, yeah, you know which is which is which <laughs> is a methodolic me, method it's a it's a method it's a change of but have increased you're still using the mmrt method yeah, your okay, your instrument okay, okay, has changed okay 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 one second one second just one second let me let me bring in mr islam mr islam the biggest problem that people have is that the methodology has changed quite dramatically See, uh, Rahul. Every time they only speak about the methodology. No, but there is a point there because Even some the people GDP have suggested that you should have just, had just, a, a control mechanism where you hold. should have used uh, perhaps the old methodology once uh. and gone with the next, the new one also, and you could have had a, you know, set of you could have then built on the variations uh, on the Rahul, data. You could have Rahul. cross-referenced. Yeah. Even Rahul. Even for even for GDP calculation. Yes. they also had this problem with this methodology that we have changed methodology even though mm. it is the uh, the uh, the global community has accepted the world bank accepted the imf have accepted the methodology and yet they had problems so they they perennially criticize about the methodology but the most important uh, uh, observation which i want to uh, explain yeah. the three most important observation rahul one that it suggests the data which you have also referred most of the numbers you have referred so i'm not going to repeat but it only suggests that inequality in the society has declined significantly we were talking about the 5% bottom population okay. in the rural area yeah. and the 5% bottom in urban uh, area it has narrowed okay. the gap has narrowed secondly the uh, the uh, the consumption pattern has definitely changed the uh, in last 10 years and that suggests because okay. if you just see how people have started spending that's beyond true. food beyond food and that's the food because 46% it has come from 53% so consumption has because definitely because changed no people even going for and okay no, no yeah just Third a second point. just a round, round. Yeah. just a second round even no even for uh, for uh, 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 they go out for visit and all the places because they have disposable income. I have recorded those, those numbers. What is your third point? Beyond food as well. Uh, we've done so, that. Um, we put that fact out. Yes. Third point is. Yeah. No, no, no. Third point is the poverty ele- uh, elevation. Their poverty has declined. Two or twenty-five crore people has come off. That also suggests that there there is a decline in poverty. Okay. And that well, is, that's, that's where that's where there is a bit of a diverge. Number, number, Now let number, me just. Number, yeah. Okay. Very quickly, is, sir. The, the, no 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 just just no, just one one argument yeah from 1985 to 2015 half a trillion dollar worth has been spent as subsidy it has really come out of the help the society to come out of the uh, uh, poverty no but last 10 years with dbt with jandhan with all the initiative it has actually indeed helped the uh, the society or the okay. marginalized well, section of well, society well let me tell you this viewers let me tell you there are numbers and there are statistics and then you know there is the big l uh, a lot of people say that there are lies you see that's the big l that i'm referring to now i am not suggesting here that there's anything wrong with the numbers there are people on this show two different schools of thought clashing over the airwaves suggesting that the methodology is representative of the change and therefore it is bona fide there's another lot that says no at the end of the day viewers we are of course just that two months refer to UN data. one second sir one that second yes i know i know I, i know mr sam i am not suggesting anything i am now leaving it i am now leaving it as it will be in the next two months it is the voter that's going to go out there and decide whether his life has actually improved for the better and whether modi gets a second chance now viewers is that an objective enough objective enough uh standard to judge the performance of the government well it's still a democracy it's an electoral democracy viewers we leave it in the court of the public